Okay, so welcome to the final lecture. Um, so I had planned initially to um, state and go over most of the proof of Bezra Kamenikov's equivalence, and at the very end of the lecture today, I will get to the statement of Bezra Kamenikov's equivalence. So the moral is that things take longer than I expect, which is maybe not a surprise. Um, so today will be very, um, very kind of high level. Uh, basically, I want to discuss three things. I want to discuss um, kind of causal duality. I want to discuss monoidal co causal duality and Bezra Kamenikov Yun. And finally, I want to state Bezra Kamenikov's equivalence. So uh, a potted history of. Um, of causal duality. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm just repeating um, CF section three of um, my ICM report. So I'm just summarizing what's written there, um, which means that if any of the following is confusing, you know where to look. And also when I was writing the ICM report, I, I looked carefully at um, the original papers um, and now I can't find, so there's this paper uh, of Balins and Ginsburg, a preprint called something like um, Mixed categories, X duality, and representations, where they made the conjectures about causal duality. And at some point, I had this paper and now I can't find it anymore. So um, I'm kind of relying on my previous self. What does potted mean? Why is the history potted? Potted means, um, well, it, under my understanding of the, of the phrase potted history, it means a kind of history that you would tell someone that's possibly a little bit unreliable. <laughs> like, you, you know, that it involves some aspect of um, kind of urban myth or... Okay, very good. Okay, so since you ask a question, I'll tell you a story that I just told Anna last week. Um, I was in Chicago and I was sitting down with uh, Balinson and Ginsburg and I asked them, um, where does... How did you come up with the cultural duality conjectures? And, and Balins had said, oh, I don't know. And Ginsburg says, I can remember exactly. And then Balins like, oh, tell me. And then Ginsburg said, um, it was a summer in the mid 80s or early 80s. And they were both in summer houses in Dutchess. Um, and there was about 30 kilometers or miles between these two Dutchess. And every day, um, Ginsburg would get on his bicycle and ride across to Sasha's Dutcher and they would work for a few hours and then Ginsburg would ride back. Um, and he said that this was a very inspiring time for him. And he said at some point he rode on his bike and he'd just become aware of the Kajanitsi conversion formula, which I won't go over today, but it's basically the fact that if you take the matrix of Kajanitsi polynomials for a finite file group and you compute its inverse, you basically get a matrix of Kajanitsi polynomials up to sign and re reordering. You have to kind of rearrange the rows and columns and, and put in some signs in an easy way and you get the same matrix back again. Um, and, and at that point they were aware of the Kajanitsa conjecture and, um, and Ginsburg was kind of suggesting that this, this, mat this identity, this matrix had some kind of remarkable consequence for category O. And apparently in Ginsburg's version of the story, so this is an example of potted history, Balinson just pointed straight at the formula and said, this is causal duality. And it then took them about five years to work out precise conjectures. But um, at that point, Balinson had been playing with the causal resolution, for example. And uh, so that's how this whole big business began in this potted history. Uh, okay. So we take um, O0 the principal block of category O for 
G. And this has familiar objects, standard objects, co-standard objects, simple objects, tilting objects, projective objects, and injective objects in decomposable injectives and projectives. And we can consider the category O for the dual. And then I'll denote delta X check. And so Bayens and Ginsburg in this remarkable preprint in 86, so conjectured. And then Bayens and Ginsburg Zergel proved the following statement. So firstly, O0 admits a, a grading. And we denote by M the shift of grading functor. And one has to be a little bit careful about what it means for a, an abelian category, like category O, to a bit of grading. Um, I won't go into this at the moment. Just think that O0 is equivalent to modules over some ring, some algebra, and a grading is the same thing as putting a grading on this algebra and considering graded modules. Um, and of course, you can always equip something with the trivial grading. Um, and that's ruled out by the following part two. Um, this is really where the, and we have graded lifts. So, so basically, if you think about which modules over a graded algebra lift, generally not all modules do but modules that are kind of isolated in the moduli space of modules do. So any module that you can characterize by some um, canonical property, like the fact that it's projective or something, if you have finitely many projectives, um, lifts, and so we have lifts, which I'll denote by tildes. Uh, lifts. And then um, there exists an equivalence Kappa from the bounded derived category of the graded version of O0 to the bounded derived category of the graded version of the dual, such that it has this weird um, interaction with the grading. So this is an equivalence of triangulated category, so it has to commute with the um, with the triangulated shift functor, but it doesn't need to commute with the shift of grading functor, and it doesn't. We have this relation, and its effect on objects is the following. So delta x maps to delta x inverse w0 check. I see x was simple. So simples map to injectives. And projectives map to symbols. Okay, so this um, should already look like a very strange equivalence because it intertwines uh, intertwines um, symbols and projectives. So it's something like a Fourier transform type. Um, type derived equivalence. And um, so I guess the most important things about this are um, that such a thing cannot exist before we introduce this graded version. So if you think about an equivalence that's matching simples and projectives, then if the simples have non-trivial x, which will almost always be the case, they can't go anywhere on the other side. You know, there's, 
there's a grading on x between simples which would just it has to go somewhere on the other side if this is an equivalence and basically this goes to some kind of weight grading on the other side um i guess another point about to um about this equivalence is if you try to think what this does on growth and degroups, groups it's basically equivalent to the casualistic inversion formula uh, and what else is important to say about this it's probably impossible to appreciate appreciate this given what i've said um, if you haven't seen this before okay but there's some wacky derived equivalence can somebody if i'm missing something really basic to say please let me know otherwise i'll continue Okay, but basically there should exist this wacky derived equivalence. Okay, so there's two comments related to kappa, which suggests I might have it wrong. So you said kappa commutes with the um, shift in the triangulated category structure. Yes. Masters equivalence of triangulated categories. So on the right-hand side, that can't be oh. the, the square bracket shift. In oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you're right, of course. Thank you, yeah. And um, Peter asks, okay, I'll answer Masood's question in a second. Peter asks, what is kappa squared? Um, kappa squared uh, at the moment is, me, is just a crazy thing. Um, like, yeah, at, so it, in a second, I'll introduce a more symmetrical version, but at the moment, kappa squared is nothing particularly nice. Um, oh no, maybe kappa squared is the Sear functor or something. But anyway, kappa squared does not preserve um, preserve hearts in any meaningful way. Um, so I would say that our current understanding of this. So Masood is asking what what should we think about this um, in the world of D modules, and I would say that it is in some sense an unsolved problem to understand this geometrically um all proofs of causal duality um that i know of appear to pass through algebra and i understand that it's one of something that balinson thought about an enormous amount what is the kind of geometric um incarnation of causal duality so it should be some kind of very fancy fourier transform but and and maybe um, in this uh, context, it's worth mentioning kind of Zergel's conjecture, which see, which sees causal duality as a manifestation of Langland's duality for uh, real Lie groups. So there's actually a way of seeing this as um, this causal duality equivalence as being um, a manifestation of kind of categorified local geometric Langlands for a complex group regarded as a real Lie group. So that's... Ah, thank you, Kyla. Okay. And if you're new to this world, um, I gave um, uh, an hour-long talk in the MSRI summer school on Zergel bimodules, which basically explains this slide okay, in much more detail. Okay, so Balance and Ginsburg. In 99. Notice something remarkable, which it's kind of surprising that it wasn't noticed earlier. Um, that if we compose kappa with um, the so called radon transform, so this means um, convolving with the longest element plus inversion I, I literally mean g goes to g inverse then we get a different version so now we go uh, and plus um, work in a geometric setting
as Masood suggested. Because we've done this inversion business, this takes us over to B check mod G check. Like this. And now uh, things are much nicer. So for example, here, when we can compose with, um, with this radon transform, that gets rid of this W zero. And when we apply inversion, it gets rid of this inverse. And so Delta X, goes to, cool. Um, it turns out that Nabla X goes to Nabla X, um, IC X tilde goes to um, tilting check and tilting check goes to IC. Yeah, which is a super, super nice observation. Uh, and so this um, equivalence becomes um, like it squares, it squares to the identity functor. So it's literally an involution. Um, and it's symmetrical in both, both sides. So when you see this version of the equivalence, you can start to dream a little. Uh, um, so it should work. Okay, the original formulations of, of causal duality use W0 in an essential way, as did their proofs. And so it's not even really clear until you have this reformulation, reformulization of um, Balance and Ginsburg, what it should mean for an affine group, for example. But now we have a statement which readily generalizes to Katz Moody groups. And the second statement is kind of to do with like how do we understand this and in particular, how do we prove it? So the proofs in uh, BGS, for example, heavily use the fact that you have this big projective object and its end of orphism ring is known by a theorem of Zergel as ex and a version of this due to Bernstein that Joe explained um, two weeks ago. Um, and so even if you kind of believe that this works for a Katz Moody group, it's really not clear how to prove it. But if you think about the way that we understand ICs, we use the fact that you can convolve. And you could dream that there's some kind of monoidal version. So a kind of monoidal version. i.e. that we construct some equivalence here by saying that the ICs corresponding to simple reflections should go to the tilting sheaves. And then we convolve, we use monoidal structures on both sides to build up the equivalence. So roughly speaking, this should semi-simples and the, we should have an equivalence so this is very much in dreamland at the moment. Semi-simples, tiltings with some fancy convolution. But you don't need to think about this very much to realize that you're very much in dreamland. And the basic problem is the fact that um, Tx, so this is an indecomposable tilting sheaf. Oh, 
we, that we can convolve this, so this lifts to dBg mod B, if and only if X is the identity. And remark, Okay, so roughly speaking, we have this category where we can happily convolve and where in some sense we're used to working. And then in order to have this tilting sheaf, we need to go up to G mod GU. So here TX exists. So we're forced to go up to here to have the existence of this tilting sheaf. But now we can't convolve. Okay. Um, and so we're forced to go up to du g mod u. But this brings a whole lot of new problems with it, which I now want to explain. Um, so the second problem is that star, the convolution, as we would guess the definition from our knowledge of the convolution of sheaves on BGB, is not exact. DUG mod U. And we really wanted some world in which we can take these tilting sheaves and convolve them happily, and all we ever get is tilting sheaves. So we really want this product to be exact. Uh, so, in order to explain this issue, I think it's useful to think about S1. Uh, and we have a nice exercise. If we take local systems, L1 and L2, local systems on S1, and if we convolve them, Say M lower star. We get the cohomology of L1 tensored with the Joule of L2, tensor with L1 tensored L2. So that's the exercise. Um, and what's the issue? Is that if L is the local system on S1, um, corresponding to V with one odd mu, then H0 of S1 with coefficients of L is the invariance and H1 S1 of L is the co-invariance. And so this implies that either, so basically the issue is that um, for a finite dimensional vector space, what, what we would like is that this to be, for this, for some magical reason to be concentrated in one degree. Then we could renormalize to get an exact tensor product. 
But the problem is that um, for finite dimensional V, we have the invariance is non-zero if and only if the co-invariance is non-zero. Yeah. So you think about the kind of invariance as being the top of your Jordan block and the co-invariance as being the bottom or something like that. So you, you, you can't have a top without a bottom for a finite dimensional vector space. Um, so this implies that star is either zero or not exact. So we've seen this calculation a number of times. I hope it's not too, I hope it's um, comprehensible now. Are there questions? Typos? Surely. I wonder if I've ever made, made it through a slide in this course without having a typo. Uh, Okay, so what's the solution is to uh, be courageous and to consider infinite dimensional local systems. So the solution is to take um, is to, to take L corresponding to a power series ring where our monodromy is simply multiplication by one plus. And note that the invariants are zero, but the co-invariants, which is just one minus mu, is C. So roughly speaking, we think about L, I mean, this is not literally the case, but I think it's useful. So we think about this as being a Jordan block that has a bottom and not a top. So it has co-invariance, but no invariance. And now, um, now maybe exercise part two. Is that M lower star of L box L shifted by one is simply isomorphic to L. So we have a nice exact tensor product. Okay. So at the expense of introducing these infinite dimensional local systems, we can have an exact tensor product. Okay. So now this gets um, taken to the kind of next level by Vesel Kamikov Yun. So some might say, say this is when good times turn bad. Um, okay, the technical details here are reasonably formidable. What they define is the following. So D So we consider U mod G mod U mapping down to B mod G mod B. And this has an intermediate map which is
So they look at the full subcategory inside uh, U mod G mod U, consisting of um, Q upper star of D of B mod G mod B. And this is, of course, the same thing as P upper star of D U mod G mod B inside D of U mod G mod U. So roughly speaking, what we're doing is we're taking sheaves on the base affine space, which have unipotent monodromy along the fibers. So example, if G is C star, D of B or G mod B is simply, so in this particular case, B equals G and G mod B mod U is simply a point. So this is P upper star of db of a point inside the drive category of c star. And this is the same thing as the full subcategory consisting of those f such that the cohomology sheaves of F are local systems with unipotent monodromy. And B, if G equals SL2, then G mod U is C2 without zero and D is the uh, full subcategory inside D of G mod U generated by the constant chief on the um, on C star and the constant sheaf on C two without zero. So, Jordi, yes, maybe you should say that this kind of idea of going to this kind of generalized infinitesimal character was already in Bailinson's nineteen eighty three ICM talk. Uh, that's true. So, this is a way of so. No, just just as a comment, it, it, it didn't. It doesn't come out of the air. <laughs> yeah. So, what Carrie is saying is that in the D module world, in order to realize um, generalized infinitesimal character in Valence and Bernstein localization. Um, we kind of already knew to consider monodromic sheaves on the base affine space. Is, is that what you're saying, Kerry? Yes, exactly. Exactly that, yes. Okay, so in this picture, we've got um, C2 without zero. So this is base affine space. So it's missing the zero point. And then we consider the full subcategory generated by this is Q on the constant chief on C star. And then we have the constant chief on everything. Oops. So this is the upper star of Q on a point inside P1. And this is P upper star of IC P2. 
interesting one. Okay, and and now, for example, this this point sheaf down here can't extend with itself, but here on C star, it has many extensions with itself, and we can start building more and more interesting objects. And then, using exactly the same definition as normal, I mean, exactly the same except we re re replace B by U, we get um, a convolution product We get a convolution product, except um, that the multiplication map is not proper. And so we have to decide whether we use M star or M shriek. And this is just a um, convention we use M shriek. And we shift by the uh, we shift by something that I'm okay. So at the end of the day, in a second, we'll um, have a lightning introduction to these free monodromic things, and on that particular category, it doesn't matter whether you use M shriek or M star. Okay, are there any questions based on this business? Okay, so now this is really where the fun starts, the very technical point, which um, so this is CF. Yun's appendix. Basically, um, to Bezra Kavnikov Yun, basically, in order to add these kind of th these things that we saw before, these like um, infinite dimensional local systems, you want to add certain pro objects. And taking a pro objects in a triangulated category does not produce a triangulated category in general. And so you need to um, add them in the right way and check that you get a triangulated category. And this all works, but it's very difficult. Um, and I'll just say that um, we can complete. So for the purposes of this talk, this means that there's this miraculous procedure, which means putting a hat on top of to allow pro local systems like C from earlier. And B, um, this convolution product extends to D hat. Okay, so uh, And now we get a monoidal category tilt hat inside the hat. 
which is called free monodromic. Tilting sheaths. And U is exact. On tilt at. And roughly speaking, you can think that along the fibers, um, the monodromy looks like now it's a power series ring in rank of T many variables, and the monodromy is given by um, some kind of universal procedure. Um, so, and then the theorem. Um, is of so one of the theorems of Bezrel Kamenikov and Yun is that tilt with this new tensor product is equivalent to a category of Zergel bimodules a hat where this is the um, we take SBIM for um, the functions on the um, on Lee of T check. So note dual. Which is of course the functions on the dual of the Lee algebra of T. And we completed on the grading. And it's a nice exercise to show that this is the same thing as Zergel bimodules. For R hat. So if we denote by R this graded ring, this is the completion of R at zero. Okay. So in the theory of Zergel bimodules, we really use the fact that it's a graded, graded setting. But there's another theory that you can do, which is just regard your ring as being um, a complete local ring. As a like complete your ring R and build the theory over a complete local ring instead. And so you get a slightly different category of Zergel bimodules, which is called SBIM hat, and this is equivalent to tilt. And the um, idea of the proof Perhaps one should also say CF Zergel So this completion procedure um, also shows up when you try to understand Harishandra bimodules via Zergel bimodule techniques uh, So what's the idea of the proof? It's basically so we, we want um, we want a functor here and remember in the setting of on the kind of other side of causal duality or something this functor is given by hypercomology and it turns out that this this side is given by um, um, Verdier's monodromy action. So So the idea of the proof is that imagine that we have X over Y a T torsor and we can consider we can define DB 
of x t to be the full subcategory generated by p upper star of d b y inside dbx. So this is monodromic. Sheaves. And then there's this fundamental observation of Verdier is that every object of dBx t carries a canonical and unipotent pi 1 of t action. So if you think about local systems on a circle, then we know that this is the same thing as vector spaces with, like taking stalk gives us an equivalence with vector spaces with an action of Z. Um, and then you can see that in fact, every stalk has a canonical action of Z given my monodromy. And this is a generalization of that fact. So i.e. this is linear over the group algebra of the torus. And moreover, this is unipotent. And so we can complete at the augmentation ideal and take, take logs. We get that um, um, we get um, that this category is db of x t is r hat linear. Okay. And now um, in the setting above, it's kind of, you know, it's monodromic for the torus on both sides. Ah, what properties of t are we using? We're just using that um, t is a torus. I haven't thought about um, beyond the torus. So in this setting of um, these monodromic categories, we have a, it's, it's a kind of T torsor in two different ways. And so we have a R hat action on the left and the right. And now with a bit of cooking, that gives us this functor. Um, so I'll just finish with theorem. Is that V, I actually haven't explained what V is, but I hope you believe that we're within a neighborhood of being able to define V. V is fully faithful. And monoidal. And, um, and just a remark is that adding weights um, one gets monoidal equivalences from um, this category of free monodromic tilting sheaves, which are now mixed.
is equivalent to Zergel biomodules, tensor product over R, and this is equivalent to the semi simple Hecker category for the dual group. This was explained last time. And so this, and now taking um, homotopy categories. When we take homotopy category of tilting sheaves, this is always just the derived category. So we get um, D mixed. Mod B is equivalent to the Hecker category, um, which is equivalent to kind of D mixed of okay. which is our kind of dreamed for this is the this is the dreamed of. Uh, and maybe just one point is that this is not quite as symmetric as the as the kind of initial statement would lead you to hope, because um, you can, yeah, you would like to say that like uh, um, when we when we go down to when we forget about um, equivariance on one side of this monodromicity, then we get an equivalence that really sends ICs to to tilting sheaves and um, and tilting sheaves to ICs. So it's totally symmetrical. But in this world, we don't have tilting sheaves here and ICs don't make a heap of sense over here. Okay. So um, it's very good, but it doesn't quite, it's not quite as nice as the initial um, dream would suggest. Okay, so I will um, we'll have a break for seven minutes or so. And then I'll get to the statement of Bezra Kamnikov's equivalence.
So I was kind of confused about where did the infinite dimensional uh, local systems like appear? Um, when we, basically when we did this completion. So I guess, uh, so what is the relationship between these tilt hats and the old tilting modules? Uh, ah, you... So this is, yeah, this is like the next um, thing that I'm going to say, that if you take a tilting sheaf, so like if we think about just on C star, so you take this free monodromic thing and you push it forward and it's magically just concentrated in one degree and you get a vector space. Um, and then the statement is that these free, um, free monodromic tilting sheaves on G mod U, when you push them forward to G mod B, they're magically just tilting sheaves. Oh, so even though they were infinite dimensional, the comma, I see, I see, cool. It's um, pretty nice. Uh, also, earlier in the formula for like what happens when you convolve local systems on S1, mm -hmm. I was slightly confused about what you. Would, maybe I was maybe I was being silly. Like, is the rank right? For example, um, this formula, if I understand it, isn't additive in like L one. Let's say. Or rather, the left hand side sh should be additive, but the right hand side. Quadratic. Why do you say that the right hand side is quadratic? Um, so if I just if I replace L one with like L one prime plus L one double prime or something, wouldn't the cohomology will be a sum, and then the other factor will also add up. Uh, it'll be a product of two sums, wouldn't it? Are you trying to say cohomology is distributing over addition on L1? Yes. I uh, but I, okay, I can yeah. phrase my confusion another way. So like if you take the stock of this convolution at the identity of S1, mm -hmm. then the five, so what is, yeah, what is that stock? It seems like it's cohomology of L1 tensor L2 dual and then uh, I'm not getting anything else. So where would be the first example where it should be wrong? Uh, I think if we take L1 and L2 both to be trivial, and but rank two, then uh, okay. let's see. Well, on the left-hand side, you should somehow get, I think, a constant local system, which is the Let's say L2 is rank one trivial, L1 is rank two trivial. On the left-hand okay. side, you get rank two trivial. On the right-hand side, you get um, something bigger. No, on the, on the left-hand side, I get rank four trivial. Rank four trivial. Like two copies, two copies in degree zero, two copies in degree one. Yeah. But and on the left-hand right side... Hand side I get, hmm, you're right, this looks suspicious. Ah, ah, what's going on? Now, it's really that you're supposed to just get the cohomology, which is of L1 tensor L2, which is just a natural local system. Is that right? Maybe we can do this as an exercise after. Do you know what the correct statement is yet? The cohomology factor tells you what the stalk is, that it is the correct rank of the stalk. Right. Ah. ah, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, so I can just cheat and say at one. Who's this? <laughs> and now there's another operator. 
So that's a weaker statement, but sure. Yes. But it's, it's a weaker statement that suffices for the discussion below. And is also more correct. <laughs> yes. Has the advantage of being correct. Oh, and then this thing. Like, this thing has a, you know, it's a tensor product. So this is an S1 module, but it has another S1 action just coming from one of the factors. And that gives you the monodromy. That's right. Let's begin again. So a beautiful feature. Is that if we we can consider this push forward map and pi lower star of a free monodromic tilting sheaf shifted by the rank of the torus is simply the indecomposable tilting sheaf downstairs. So in other words, um, taking co-invariance So in general, slogans are meant to be catchy. That's not a very catchy slogan, but such is life. Uh, but it's really beautiful that we have these. It's, it's analogous to the fact that if you take a Zogel biomodule and you kill the um, action of polynomials on the, on the right, then you get a Zogel module. So it's, um, I mean, if you know that statement and, and you like that statement, then this is precisely analogous. And if you don't know that statement, then that's meaning, meaningless anyway. Um, and remark, um, with enough So with enough homo homological algebra, i.e. with way more homological algebra than I ever dreamed existed, um, one can do all of the above. Algebraically and also modulo P, um, CF, um, Hacha Makasumi. So for various purposes in modular representation theory, it's very, very useful to have this thing with mod P coefficients. Um, there's a big problem in doing so, which is manifested in the, in the bit where I said take logs. It's also manifested in the bit when I, where I said very, very technical. Um, but anyway, you can do all, all of this, um, you know, with enough homological algebra, you can do everything algebraically in terms of circle biomodules. Um, and about 250 pages later, you have nice theorems, but it does take about 250 pages. Okay. So now I get to the statement of bezel kamnikovs equivalence. So firstly, we do the constructible side. And that's reasonably easy now. So we have GBT. And to this, we have a many familiar objects. We have GT, we have the Iwahori, 
Less familiar is the um, pro-unipotent radical. We have the affine flag variety. We have the affine Grassmannian. Then we have Fle tilde, which is GT mod I zero. And this is the affine analog of base affine space. Some people also call this the extended affine flag variety. You could also call it the affine base affine space. Um, and now we have uh, five categories. The II. So this is I mod um, mod I. We have D I zero I, which is D I zero G T mod I, the affine analog of U mod G mod B. We have D I zero I zero, which is D of I zero and these also have monodromic completions. And the kind of key diagram for everything is that we have this, this kind of bimodule for these two. So this goes back to classical observations that you can kind of see category O as being the regular representation of the vial group where you have an action of translation functors on one side and um, Zuckerman or shuffling functors on the Zuckerman functors on the other side. And it's a bimodule for these two actions. So that's the constructible side. The co coherent side is a bit more involved. Yes, thanks, Nasir. So we have G, we have G check. We have little G check, it's Lie algebra. And inside this, we inside here we have the nilpotent cone. Here we have the Springer resolution, and here we have the Grothendieck Springer resolution. And this is defined to be. X B inside G times B check. Such that X is in B. So we've discussed this growth in the spring resolution some time ago. Um, and recall that if we have x over y proper,
then we can consider coherent sheaves on x times y x and this has a monoidal structure e.g. Um, n tilde check over n tilde n tilde check is the Steinberg variety and the Grothendieck group of this thing is the affine Hecker algebra and this is the Kajnanistic isomorphism. If I insert appropriate equivariance. So we need a variant, um, we need a derived version But this, so don't worry too much about this, this will mostly disappear. So it doesn't disappear in one point. That, so we need a derived version, which is, um, the derived fiber product, and this is a DG scheme. Um, and the key points is that db co on this dg scheme is still monoidal. And two, if uh, if this map has no higher Tor groups, then the derived, this derived version is just isomorphic to the standard. And roughly speaking, the way that you can think about this is um, in Hartshorn, when you learn how to form a fiber product of schemes, you firstly do the affine case and then you glue, and the affine case is given by a tensor product, A tensor over B with A. But now when you do this, you should resolve, um, you should resolve in the category of commutative DG algebras. And you get, um, so this, locally looks like um, the ring of functions is locally DG algebra. Okay. And so coherent cheese on these are DG modules over this it's DG algebra. Um, is condition two the same as being flat? No, it's um, much weaker than being flat. So for example, um, Oh, for ex I mean, the examples in a second that we'll see will, will satisfy too, but they won't be flat. So now we can... So we define the object, so Steinberg... is the fiber product a priori derived of the growth and Dick simultaneous resolution with itself. And in this case, the Tor condition is satisfied. So this is just the ordinary fiber product. is um, and again, this is just the ordinary fiber product. D 
These both follow from the tour condition. And then there's a genuinely derived thing, which is amusing because it's the thing that you would kind of, the non-derived thing is the, is what you would imagine from um, the Kajanamutsuk isomorphism. I agree with um, Peter's answer to Masood's question. Uh, so, what you would guess in the Kajanamutsuk version is that we just take the um, fiber product of the Springer resolution with itself over the nilpotent cone, which um, in the non-derived world coincides with this fiber product. But this is, if we do it this way, this is genuinely derived. So here are our objects. And Bezwakamnikov's equivalence is the statement that so my understanding again this is a potted history is that Bezokamnikov had some idea of how to prove this in the early night in the early 2000s but it took him about um, 20 years to write so it was only published about two years ago um, so there exists vertical equivalences So firstly, we have the constructible version, which is I zero I is a module over D I I is a left module over D I zero I zero. And now this is equivalent to D B co G check in check of the G Steinberg. I should also say that if we take coherent sheaves on this, for example, then it's a module over this, it's a left module over this, and it's a right module over this. So like when we take of coherent sheaves, this acts on this and this acts on this. Um, so this is equivalence A, B, C. And in order to try to answer Masood's question, why do, we, why do we care about the derived scheme? So I would say that when you initially start looking at this problem, this is the version that you would be interested in describing in a coherent, in a coherent way. This is the kind of, this is the affine Hecker algebra that jumps out at you. But you can see by hand that if we leave the, the derived scheme out here, then this, this equivalence is incorrect. It cannot be the case. But, and that reasonably simple considerations give you that. Um, and somehow, I mean, there's an enormous amount of contributions of Ezra Kavnikov here, but just to realize that, so it turns out that this is actually much easier to show with this monodromic version. So I'll just make some comments on the, on the proof and then I'll finish. Um, Sorry, in the definition of these Steinberg varieties, the fiber product is over G? Uh, Always over G check, yeah. I think it was written a little bit above was maybe... Over, total 
Oh, sorry. So the density of typos here was greater than normal. Thank so, you. Jordi, is it possible to say uh, in a sentence or two what those easy considerations you were talking about is that shows that we need the derived version? So, uh, basically, I think you can already see... I, I think you already... Um, so basically, you can ask what should map to the structure sheaf of the Steinberg, and um, and this is some something like the um, the um, ah, the IC of the finite flag variety inside the um, inside the affine flag variety, and the X algebras don't match up. So somehow there's nothing with correct support whose x x algebra um, here would match the um, x algebra of the um, structure sheaf of the Steinberg variety. That's one consideration. Probably you can also see it with Wakimoto's. Um, so it, I mean. One way, like I, I know I've said this a number of times, so apologies if I sound like a broken record. Whenever you form these fiber products, there's always the diagonal copy of, so there's the diagonal cap copy of G check inside here, and there's the diagonal copy of N tilde check inside, inside here. And you should think about coherent sheaves supported on those as being like diagonal matrices. And so the coherent sheaves supported on here are what corresponds to the Wakimoto sheaves. And I think that you can see reasonably easily um, just by considerations of wacky moto sheaves here and here that the X, X algebras are not correct. Also. Uh, so one, B and C are, um, reasonably straightforward consequences of A. Oh, and so, I mean, this, this means, um, these two arrows mean set theoretically supported. Um, so, and Bezrukavikov on A. The second point is that um, Somehow I've been harping on about this free monodromic completion, but this is nowhere in this um, picture. Um, so we can consider the formal completion of n check and um, the key technical statement
is that this monodromic category with the um, the completion of the so the free monodromic category is equivalent to db co g check on this completion of the Steinberg variety. Okay, so roughly speaking, you can think that if you complete, so if you just look at sheaves supported set theoretically in some closed subscheme, then this is difficult to handle because you don't have kind of projective objects or something like that. But once you complete, you have projective objects um, and they correspond over here to some kind of free monodromic things. And so then you have generators where you can hope to prove things. And then the proof So uh, I've, I've gone to some effort to try to explain the proof of Akipogos Rakamnikov. Um, and basically, if you understand the ideas of Akipogos Rakamnikov, this proof is not so surprising. I mean, it's considerably more difficult, but um, the, the structure of the argument at least is, uh, is quite clear. Um, and then I feel somewhat guilty for not explaining consequences of this theorem, but um, so the theorem has, has several remarkable conflict consequences. Um, but exploring them. We'll have to wait. Okay, it's, I think um, it's kind of becomes a unifying tool in geometric representation theory, this theorem. Uh, and so for example, Lustig theory of cells in affine bile groups and things like that. I've explained this to some extent, but um, it all becomes much clearer um, in this language and also mod p versions of this which is why i'm interested in it has um very strong consequences in modular representation theory so you can kind of specialize this down to get various equivalences that are enormously difficult to get otherwise um but yes that is the end of this course um i'm somewhat relieved and thank you for um sticking with it <laughs>